Good morning. So happy to see you all here and also um, you who join us in online. A um, couple of days ago, watch this uh, musical, Esther. That was long, two hours and a half. But <laughs> yeah, I thought it's about an hour, but two hours and a half, very beautiful storyline. But, you know, um, Esther and all the uh, Israel people, they were about to kill. And the uh, enemy Haman uh, had uh, trapped them and almost they're going to wipe all the Jews. And the people are fasting and praying and asking God, why God, why you allow this to us? Save us. Why aren't you doing anything here? We are about to die. Where are you, God? But Esther constantly reminds through the, uh, the musical, this is the Bible verse she sings quite often. Be still and know that I am God. A couple of uh, days ago, I, I talked to the medical staff, and it's not just one person. Several of them approached me good Christians saying, Jennifer, I don't understand why we have to go through this. We pray hard and pray, where is God? God is listening to our prayer. Why this pandemic is not ending? It's more spread out and more severe situation we face with. Be still and know that I am God. You know, God is working through all this difficult time and all this darkness. I can tell, um, I can share this one thing, even though it seems like nothing is happening at the church, but we are going to start DTC, Discipleship for our Young People, today. So please pray for, pray for them, because we've been praying for, for our younger generation. Give them uh, thirst and hunger to know you, and there are several of them saying, I want to know more about God. That is why they are applying for this DTC. So I just want to remind you, it seems like nothing is happening, nothing is moving. God is always working. God is always moving. And we want to be part of that. So I want to invite you to pray with me this morning to start our worship service. Father, thank you so much for your grace and mercy. And your love is it's a never-ending and unconditional love. And thank you for being with us all the time. You're God of Emmanuel. You're with us all the time. You never said you're going to remove um, the flood or fire in our lives, but you always promise that you are with us. You are going to go through with us. So thank you, Lord. Thank you for your um, faithfulness in our lives. And help us to focus on that, Lord. As your people, help us to see where you are moving. Help us to see what you are doing so we can be part of that and we can be blessing in this world. And I just lift up this DTC um, to you, to your hands, and they want to know more about you. Use them mightily, show yourself to them, and Holy Spirit's presence will be there all the time, and fill them up with your spirit. This morning, we want to praise and worship no matter what we are going through, because you are our God, Almighty One. You are the Alpha and Omega, and we worship you. And we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we go through difficult times, it's good to remind ourselves of how, God, how good God is to us and sing his praise for that. So we invite you to join us as we sing Good to Me. And feel free to stand. Uh, feel free to sit as well. Uh, but please sing with us.
great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my
Because I love Zion, I will not keep still. Because my heart yearns for Jerusalem, I cannot remain silent. I will not stop praying for her until her righteousness shines like the dawn and her salvation blazes like the morning torch. The nations will see your righteousness. World leaders will be blinded by your glory and you will be given the new name by the Lord's own mouth. The Lord will hold you in his hand for all to see, a splendid crown in his hand of God. Never again will you be called the forsaken city or the desolate land. Your new name will be the city of God's delight and the bride of God, for the Lord delights in you and will claim you as his bride. Be still, my soul, the Lord is on your side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to your God to order and provide. In every change, ye faithful will remain. Be still, my soul, your best, your
unravel me with a melody you surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone I'm no chosen me
so much, worship team. Thank you. Uh, you know, I tried to come up with a uh, pithy statement uh, or a pithy phrase or some kind of eloquent phrase for the title of this sermon today, and all I could come up with was just matter of fact what we're going to talk about, and that is suffering. That is not a highly uh, great selling point for any sermon. People aren't busting down the doors to hear about suffering, especially on a Sunday morning. Most people I know, many of you, you have work, you have lives. There's already a lot on your plate. You're dealing with this midst of the season we're living in, and you're saying, really? I just need a little bit of encouragement, and today you're going to talk about suffering. Well, I want you to know that suffering is a foundational Christian principle, theological principle. And I think it is so important in the midst of the season we are living in right now that we actually understand a biblical understanding of suffering. And I hope as we do so, you will be encouraged. And I think as we discuss this theme of discipleship, I think we need to be aware that this is a key facet, theological principle of training up disciples for Jesus Christ. Because if we avoid this topic, if we avoid this discussion, if we avoid it or hide from it, we will not train up leaders that we need for the church going forward. That is how important this theological principle is. And we're going to touch on a few aspects of it today. We're not going to go over everything. But I want to just I wanted to open that up and say how important this theological principle is. One of my favorite passages of scripture, a passage that I read to people, a passage that I pray over people, I actually read uh, almost the whole passage and I sometimes strategically leave the last half of a verse out. I want to just read you the passage real quick. It's Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 14 to verse 17, and just the half of 17. If we could get it up uh, on the... Nope, we need a couple minutes. No problem at all. I'm just going to keep going. You can get your Bibles out. If you are in the comfort of your own home, I hope you have a Bible. If you do not, you come and find me, call me, I will get you a Bible. Uh, the rest of you that are here in the sanctuary, please get your Bibles out. Uh, there's Bibles in the pews. It is Romans chapter 8, verse 14 to 17. Oh, there it is. And it is on the overhead now. We got it up and running. So here we go. In verse 14 it says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Hallelujah, right? I pray for many of you. I have prayed for many of you that you would realize that you are children to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That you would understand your identity. Let me keep going. Verse 15. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. and said you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. They, we, I pray that many of you would, would receive this, this personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That you would recognize that you have this intimacy with the living God. That you can cry out to him and say, Father, Daddy. That you have that kind of relationship. I prayed that prayer for so many of you. That that would be a reality in your life. Let's keep going. Verse 16. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. There is a unity. Verse 17. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ Jesus, we are heirs of God's glory. I have prayed for so many young people that they would recognize their identity, that they are heirs. They are not just someone. They are children to the King of kings and Lord of lords. They are royalty. And I ask our young people, live like it. You are royalty. You're not peasants. So don't live like a peasant. And I know some of our young people that are here have heard me say this to them or pray over them. Now, all of this is wonderful, isn't it? 
I think every person that is either joining us on the live stream or here in this building can say, hallelujah. And if I just preached this passage, we'd all be, I think, really encouraged. The problem is, there's another half a verse. And I want to read you the second, that little half a verse that it ends with. The second half of verse 17 says this. But if we share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Oh boy. And by the way, so he, all, this, all this talk of we're heirs to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that we are royalty, that we are God's children, that we should not fear because we have the Spirit of God, it's all prefaced around this idea of suffering. And I want you to know that I have never prayed for any of you that you would endure suffering. I've never laid hands on anybody and asked for that. And if I did, I don't think any one of you would be encouraged afterwards. I mean, that, what do we do with that? I mean, this idea of suffering. I mean, we know what we're talking about here, right? Sharing in God's glory in Jesus Christ. What is Paul meaning when he's talking about this suffering? He's talking about the crucifixion. He's talking about taking up the cross. He's talking about as Jesus died as a criminal on the cross who was rejected and despised by society, rejected and despised by his own people. And by the way, who in this building or online is saying amen to that? I'm ready to suffer in that way. We have the same imagery that we find in Romans in 2 Timothy that we are going to read today. And I know that there are some of you today, and there's, we have many brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus that, that are weary about such a topic that we're going to be discussing today. And I do know that this idea of suffering can get very much uh, manipulated and distorted. We need to make sure we have a biblical understanding of suffering. I'm not talking about some theology of defeatism where we are constantly so negative and morbid in, their, in our faith that, le, that we give up on God doing anything miraculous. We don't even believe that God can heal or transform lives. That's a perverted theology of suffering. And that is not the explanation or the description of what God is trying to get through to us in his word. He's not asking us to be more cynical, more critical. And this idea, I call it an ideology of defeatism. I have been around people, Christians, that are so defeated in life. And they'll use the idea of suffering for this bad theology. And they'll explain that, no, God's not going to do anything. It's just life. Life is terrible. And they've given up on life. I have actually asked somebody, a Christian, if I could pray for them for healing. And they said, no. This is what it is. I'm going to die. That's, a the, that's an ideology of defeatism. That is not what Paul or Jesus or anybody else that talks about suffering is describing in the biblical text. And that's the concern I know some of us have by talking about suffering. I'm not talking about an ideology of just giving up on life. It's actually quite the opposite. But I do believe that we as brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus have done, us, done ourselves a disservice by avoiding or hiding the topic. Because especially in the trying seasons, we need to have a good theology of suffering so that we can endure. And I've wondered at times in the midst of these almost two years of COVID if we've actually spent enough time on this particular topic. Because I see people falling apart left and right, all over. And so that's why we're going to spend time on it today. I want you to know that it's really important that a biblical principle of suffering is never, suffering is never done alone. You need to hear that. 
Listen to what Romans talks about. Romans talks about uh, it's almost this partnership with God. Second Timothy, Paul is going to invite Timothy to suffer with him. It's done together in community. It's in relationship with Jesus Christ, a partnership with the living God, because he suffered so much for us. And he understands our suffering. We don't do it alone. We do it with God and partner with him because he suffered so much on our behalf. And we do it together in community. As brothers and sisters, we hold each other up. We pray for each other. You know, it was the Paul, Apostle Paul that said when one part of our body, one part of the body is suffering, the whole body is suffering, right? We're together. Your suffering, your hardship is not supposed to be done alone in some closet or some, you know, in your home by yourself. You're supposed to bring it to your church family. And as brothers and sisters, we hold you up. It's never done in isolation. And I think that's actually some of the problem we're having in the midst of this COVID season because we're too isolated. And the hardship just is not spoken. And people just go through life and it torments them. But suffering biblically is together in community with the living God and with each other. All right. So now let's read the passage of scripture today, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 3 to 7. Endure suffering along with me. This is Paul speaking to Timothy. He says, endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life, for they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. And athletes cannot win the prize unless they follow the rules. And hardworking farmers should be the first to enjoy the fruit of their labor. Think about what I am saying. The Lord will help you understand all these things. I want you to know that when Paul gives you that, think about it. The Lord will reveal. I had to think a long time this week over this imagery. There was so many different directions I could go. He gives three very powerful professions and images of professions. What is he wanting us to take from each of these? He's speaking to Timothy to join him, partner with him, to endure suffering alongside him, just like Paul says in Romans. Well, let's talk about the soldier. There's a characteristic that I think is so important, and as we're training up other people, I think it's important that we, we recognize that our, our life, if we are a Christ follower, is that to something other than our own selfish needs. What I mean by that is we are serving a higher purpose. We are out for not our own interest. Sometimes our own interest gets in the way, but our, it, we're not out for our interest. We're out for God's interest. That is our primary goal. A soldier is willing to sacrifice himself or herself for the betterment of something else. Now, I'm not saying it is, uh, it is better. Depending on what side of the battle you're on, it might not be better. But they think it's better. A soldier will sacrifice his own life put himself in the front lines of a battle, especially in the ancient world we're talking about. We don't have the technology where we're shooting off bombs, you know, 100 miles away here. This is, this, is, this is ancient combat here. And you're putting yourself out into the front lines on behalf of your land, your family, your government, there's something, your nation, there's something that you're willing to put aside. Put aside your own personal needs for something greater. We see this time and time again in the imagery that Paul uses. And I think it's so important, he says, that soldiers don't get stuck on the civilian life. And what he's talking about is so often we can get stuck in our day-to-day, -day, the troubles of our day. Timothy has a lot of troubles in the churches he's working with. 
You're going to hear about it as we continue to go through 2 Timothy. There's a lot of troubles. There's a lot of immediate circumstances that are problematic that he needs Paul's advice. But Paul is saying, don't get stuck there because you have a greater purpose. You have something that's greater than this immediate circumstance. The problems that are right here, there's a bigger, there's something bigger that you need to be focused upon. And that is God's kingdom. And you need to be listening to him and spending time with him. Don't get stuck on these, all these immediate problems. Because there's something far greater that you're called to. And as Christ followers, we are called to something greater. And that's why we need to be so in tune with God's spirit. And we need to be listening and taking commands because we're not, a soldier is willing to sacrifice his own personal needs to serve a higher calling, to listen to his commander, to go and do something. Even if he doesn't fully understand it, he's willing to do it. And why? Because he's serving a greater goal. There's something greater in store. And often in the ancient world, often it was to protect his own family. If the barbarians are coming through, they're going to terrorize and destroy the family. That's why he's out there. And Paul is saying to Timothy, remember the greater goal. Your purpose is higher and, f and greater than these immediate problems. Don't get stuck in the, in the milieu of the, of, the, of the day, the problems of the day. And I find as uh, this is a great message for us. We often get so distraught over whatever news cycle is going on of the day. And I think Paul here is telling us, don't get too caught up here. You have an eternal purpose. There's something greater that you're serving, and it's God's kingdom. It doesn't mean we don't be informed. It doesn't mean we don't read the paper or watch the news. But what I'm getting at is don't be consumed with it. And allow it to bring such despair upon you that you're ineffective for God's kingdom. Is this making sense so far? Boy, I'd like to get somebody nodding their head. Okay, good. I got one or two. Okay, so we're going to keep going. So there's the soldier. As, as we're working with other people, there's something so important that we remind them that when we say yes to Jesus Christ, we're willing to lay down our personal needs. A soldier at times has to go out to battle. That's not, that's hard. That's awful. At times, we're going to have to make enormous sacrifices for God's kingdom. And it's part of our Christian journey. The second imagery that I think we need to spend some time on, and maybe it's one that is a little more appropriate in a society we live in, because we don't like to talk about warfare and soldiers and all of that. That imagery is not too popular out here. Uh, but the next imagery is probably a little bit more exciting to talk about, because a lot of us watch sports, a lot of us love athletics, and, uh, and so Paul uses the, this particular imagery. And what needs to be very clearly stated, the athlete, the athlete is not an, an amateur athlete. Paul is not talking about an amateur athlete, somebody or somebody that you know has a hobby. In the summertime, I like to play tennis. He's not talking about Pastor Jedediah who you know gets himself in shape for a couple months out of the year and likes to play tennis. You know, I'm in really good shape for a couple months in the summertime. And then it all goes, you know, down the tubes. That's not what he's talking about. He's particularly using a word for a professional athlete. Do you know the sacrifices and the discipline a professional athlete has to go through? A professional athlete is not, after this service, going to Timmy's and going to pound a half a dozen donuts. A professional athlete has, is so regiment on their eating habits on their workout routines, on everything. I don't know if you've ever been around professional athletes. I've told you this once, I'll tell you again. My mother, when I was growing up, worked at a athletic gym. And she was a supervisor there. And in California, an athletic gym, you can imagine the kind of athletes that would come in to that gym. And there were professional athletes, professional football players, baseball players, uh, the ones that always caught me and 
fascinated me was the professional bodybuilders. Because they would come in, they would have their own food prepared, they would have everything regimented, and they would work out for, I don't know, hours. And to see the suffering that these professional weightlifters went through. I mean, at times they're throwing up because they're pushing their body to such an extent. They're nauseous. This is the kind of training that goes on with professional athletes. And what Paul is saying is train yourself. Get yourself ready to compete. Professional athletes are not sitting, eating potato chips and sitting on the couch. And I think spiritually, sometimes us as Christ followers, that's the kind of, that's the kind of uh, you know, regiment we have. A lot of couch warming and potato chip eating. Spiritually. What Paul is saying is, is, is dig into God's word. Spend time with him. And it's not a regiment of, oh, I spent 10 minutes with God today and 10 minutes with God yesterday, so I'm good. No, it's about actually entering into this relationship and allowing God to enter the deepest and darkest facets of our lives and asking God to really heal us and us being proactive and putting ourselves in situations that are uncomfortable because we want to be stretched, because we want to grow, because we want Christ to transform our lives. It's not about just doing something for five minutes or 15 minutes, some regimen. It's about a relationship. It's about letting God come in and break down the strongholds in your life. And that hurts. It hurts. It's painful at times, but it is fulfilling, by the way, if you allow it. And what it is doing is it's preparing you to compete when the time comes, you don't, when the hardship comes, you don't just fall apart. You're ready to go because you've trained yourself. Your body is ready. Your spiritual body is ready to go. Do you understand? Is this making sense? Okay, I got one amen, so I'm going with it. Okay, lastly, we have the imagery of the farmer. Uh, this is the one uh, I know the least about. <clears throat> I wish I knew more about this one. Uh, I grew up in the heart of the city in California, in Fresno, California. Uh, I didn't have farmer friends growing up. Uh, I'm thankful that when I first came to Manitoba, I got to go to southern Manitoba and spend time with farmers, uh, crop farmers and cattle farmers. I got to run. Uh, I got to to spend some time on the combine. I got to go looking for cattle that was lost. Uh, I got to do a lot of redneck activities that was just beautiful. I loved it. Uh, went uh, uh, mo like biking, you know, motorcycle biking through land. I mean, it just had, a, it was an incredible experience for me. But if I was to tell you that I had any agricultural skill set, I would be lying to you. I have none, practically. But I want you to know uh, that I have, as of last year, tried to grow grass. So I'm going to use that imagery. Is everybody okay with that? I know Gary's looking at me like, really? But bear with me, Gary. It's the closest thing I could get to as far as imagery. The grass. Last year, I built a patio, a limestone patio, big limestone patio, backyard. Loved it. Well, the grass around it, well, it was just dirt now. And I needed to seed the dirt and begin the process of growing grass so that it would blend in with the rest of the yard. So I bought a bag of seed. I didn't really know what I was doing. I poured it all over. Somebody had told me you should rake it in. So I did that, did a little raking it in. Some of you might be looking at me like, that's not what you do. I just, I took whatever I could find. Then I started watering it. And I watered. And I kept watering. And at first, nothing's happening. It was actually a little bit infuriating. Did I do something wrong? So, I, you know, I pour more seed all over, right? Because I'm thinking, well, I must have done something wrong here. So I keep pouring seed all over, grass seed all over. And I keep watering. And then it got, it, this last summer, do you remember how uh, much of a drought we had last summer? How hot it was? Well, then I had to start watering multiple times a day. And all of a sudden, over a long period of time, I started to see some little sparks, some, some, some growth in certain areas. 
And so I kept watering it multiple times a day. And it became my rhythm that I just did in the morning and then in the at, late in the day. I just, that's what I did. I started watering. By the end of the summer, I was I, 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 I kept working at it. Kept working at it. I tried to be as patient as I could. At the end of the summer, I had a full set of grass. It was all good to go. And it blended in with the yard. But it took so long. Maybe you have some other type of grass seed and it's really quick. For me, it took forever. I had to tend to it nonstop. I had to watch it. I mean, I became, I was ridiculous. I was on my knees, like, checking the grass. How is it going? Like, I was inspecting it thoroughly. And it's just a little patch of grass here. I cannot imagine what a farmer goes through on a large scale. The perseverance and the amount of patience that a farmer has to have. They plant a seed in the ground, and they have to wait. And it's for their livelihood. This was not for my livelihood. This was just so my backyard looked good. And they have to continue to tend to the land and persevere. And they have to continue to be patient and wait for the harvest that is to come, Lord willing. And I think as, as Christ followers in the midst of hardship and difficulty, I think sometimes we're like sprinters. We just want to, you know, we'll do a 50-yard dash and that's it. But that's not how it works. Oftentimes we have to be patient. We have to endure because there's a refining that's going on. There's a training. But God has promised that in the midst of this hardship that we do go through, that he will reward. That there is a, there is a harvest at the end that we partake in. And that doesn't mean it happens in this lifetime. But God, remember, is thinking eternally. He's eternally mindset. And sometimes when we go through these difficult seasons and these difficult times, we just want them to be over now. Lord, heal the land now in the name of Jesus. What if that isn't Jesus' will? What if he's trying to teach us and train us in this season of time? And I think this is so important that we, we hear this message because as Paul is speaking to Timothy, we need to be investing in other people's lives. And we, we need to remind them that the hardships that come their way it's part of the journey, but they don't do it alone. They do it in community, and God goes with them. And as they are going through this hardship, it, it might not be over in a day. You might just pray, and it might not just be done. It could be. God could heal the problem. But it might be a long plan. It might be a long-term a, a solution over time. I've seen people deal with great hardship in people's lives and suffer terribly because of how people have treated them. And they continue to endure and continue to suffer even with their outbursts and their ridicule. But then 20 years later, this person is transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit and then they go back to 20 years ago when this person over there didn't give up on them. And it would have been easy to give up on him. It would have been easy. But the person continued to persevere and was patient. And I think in our society where we are so self-indulgent, so immediate gratification, I mean, look at the attention span of us now with all the tech we have. What is our attention span? It's not very great, is it? We often want results now. But that isn't how the, biblical, how the biblical text tells us how we go through this. I mean, let's be honest. There's a young man by the name of Joseph. Do we know the story? He sit, he's, he's by his own family, is put into slavery. And then it gets even worse because instead of just slavery, he then goes to prison. Prison in the ancient world is not prison in a modern-day Canadian society. I'm not saying prison in modern-day society is glamorous. I'm just trying to let you know that in the ancient world, prison was a lot more barbaric, okay? Do you know the years that he was there? From the age of 17, he was thrown in as a slave, and he didn't get out till the age of 40. For 13 years, he was either a slave or in prison. Can you imagine the amount of perseverance and patience? What would you have said? The prime years of his life. 
as a young man, his most professional years are all gone. And yet, he continued to persevere. And as people came close to him, they recognized that the spirit of the living God was with him. He didn't give up. He recognized that serving God's kingdom is greater than his own kingdom. And so he made the most of it, even in prison. And yet, eventually, when the time came, because he had trained himself, he had disciplined himself, when the time came and people needed him to interpret dreams, was he prepared? Absolutely. But he had to wait 13 years. And then what was the reward that he was given? He became the most powerful leader in the known world for the most powerful empire in the ancient world. That's what the Lord was training and working in his life and preparing him for. And if he had just not trusted in the commander, in the one that was over him, the one that was greater, if he wasn't that good soldier, he would have given up on life. Did Joseph know what was going to happen? No, God hadn't given him some revelation that it, you know, I'm going to put you in this unbelievable, he didn't know that. He just continued to trust the living God. Continued to say, you know greater. If you want me as a slave, I'll be a slave here, but I'm going to serve your kingdom. And Potiphar, what did he say? The Lord is with this guy. When he was in prison, what did the prison guard say? The Lord's with that guy. He had an influence even in these terrible circumstances because he didn't allow the immediate circumstance to overcome him and destroy him because he knew there was a God that was greater that could do far beyond anything that that Joseph could ever even imagine. And so he was going to trust the living God even though he didn't understand it all, even though he had lots of hurt. Look, I mean, let's admit his own family rejected him. His own brothers threw him into slavery. That's hurtful. Many of them wanted to kill him. That's extraordinarily hurtful. It's not that he's, his hurt just went away. But he trusted in the living God. And the Lord went with him. And the Lord gave him favor where, where he was at. And he continued to, to discipline himself and train himself. It would have been easy for him to just fall in line with whatever was going on in the ancient world, in that land. Instead, what did he do? He held true to God's word, and it got him in trouble. He ended up having to go to prison over it. But he was faithful. He was training himself. He knew that hardship was part of this journey. But he wanted to be mighty for God's kingdom. And it didn't end there. It didn't end there. Then he had to be in prison. And even after prison and after, you know, those that joined him in prison and had those dreams. You remember this story? I'm not going through it in detail here. But you remember those dreams? And I'm sorry, translators, because I don't have this in my, my, uh, my writing here. I'm just sort of going off the cuff here. But you remember the dreams. And, and, and what did Joseph say? Remember me. Remember me when these dreams, when I, as, I've, I've, as I've interpreted your dreams, remember me. Did they remember him? They absolutely did not until much later when the king had a problem with another dream. He had been forgotten and yet he continued to wait and persevere because he knew the living God was going with him. And I think today, when I, when I think of this, and I think of this, this COVID season, I, I, and people are telling me, you know, we've been at this for almost two years. Why? Why? Why are we still here? I think to myself, well, God's people were in Egypt for how many hundreds of years before they were freed? Oh, well, let's talk about their, their captivity after... After Judea, Jerusalem fell. The city of Jerusalem fell. How long were they there? How many hundreds and hundreds of years were they in that situation? Until the Savior of the world came. That was prophesied. God's people have had to endure much. But we do it together. 
and God comes alongside us and with us. We don't seek out suffering. I want you to hear this. We're not seeking it out. We're not asking for it, but we're prepared for it because it is part of life. And I want to say these last words to you, and I've, I've said this to many people, but anything that is of any great value in my life, I have had to fight for it, and I've had to, at times, go through hardship. Any goal that you set that is worthy, uh, that is a worthy goal, is not going to come easy. It's going to take enormous sacrifice, enormous amount of discipline, and yes, you're going to have to be patient because you're going to go through, you know, you're going to have setbacks. But if that is a worthy goal, you are going to encounter hardship but it's all worth it because of the goals that you have set. And that is what Paul is trying to tell us. We have the greatest calling of all to serve God's kingdom. It's greater than anything else we could give our lives to. And so, yes, at times there will be those hard times, that suffering, but we join together with our brothers and sisters. God comes alongside with us and supports us. And we will get through those difficult seasons. This, I believe, in the midst of these last almost two years, I know it's not quite two years, I think to myself, this is the training ground for us. We're not excited about this unusual season of life, but God's people time and time again have endured hardship because they recognized, they didn't run away, they didn't hide from it, they recognized that suffering is part of life because this world is fallen and they have endured for so long because Christ goes with them, because their church family goes with them. I want you to know today that if you are suffering right now in the midst of this season, you, I know many of you have, have lost loved ones in this season, Many of you have had fractured relationships, whether it be with friends or your family. Many of you maybe have just been isolated for so long that it's it's playing a mental toll on your on your psychology on your mental well-being, I should say. If that is you today, I want you to know that God will go with you. And us church family, we will be here to support you and be with you and pray with you. You are not alone. Please don't, don't, don't just suffer alone. Hide somewhere. That's not healthy. Please come and be part of your church community. I know right now we're not having everybody in the church doors, but you can call. Please reach out to me or someone on the pastoral team or someone you just know in the church. You're not alone. And I want you to know that instead of running or hiding from this season, I think it's time that we just embrace it and realize it's here and see it strategically as a time that we can be mighty for God's God's kingdom, even when we are in the midst of this pandemic. Amen? Uh, Church family, I... I thank you so much for letting me preach this sermon. I know it's not always the most comfortable sermon. Uh, Many maybe that are viewing this online particularly are wondering, uh, well, this is a faith that involves suffering. Wow, that's a hard selling point. I want you to know that you're going to go through suffering in your life regardless. But I want you to know the difference in Christian suffering and suffering in this world is that you don't do it alone that God goes with you and that he will empower you and strengthen you and he will lead you through it. And that loving God is Jesus Christ. And if today you say, I am suffering and I'm going through a lot of hardship right now in my own life and I need help, the only one I've ever been able to trust in the midst of the greatest tragedies in my life has been Jesus Christ. And so today I want to say to you, it's probably time to come to Jesus Christ. It's, it's time to give your life to him because he will walk with you through the darkest of valleys. And so could we bow our heads today and let's just say a prayer.
And for those that say yes to Jesus, hallelujah, we will celebrate with you afterwards. Lord Jesus, we come before you today and we recognize that our world is broken. And we recognize how dark this season has been for many of us. And Lord Jesus, we need you to come and heal us. And we need to give our lives over to you and allow you to lead us, to work with us and train us. And Lord, for us to be patient, not anxious, but patiently wait upon you. Lord Jesus, I ask, would you go with us? Would you lead us? Would we give our lives over to you and hand over all the mess we have created by our own efforts? Lord, we want you to heal us and forgive us of all the sin, everything in our past that was not of you, and come to you with open arms. May we do so today in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. If today you have said this for the first time, such a prayer, and you're, you're saying, I have said yes to Jesus Christ, I need him to help me navigate through this difficult season of life, I would like that you actually come and find someone. Remember, I talked about it. You don't suffer alone. And Jesus is going to be there with you, but we want you in community, in a small group, with us. Or we'll connect you. If you're watching this online and you get a hold of me and you're living somewhere else, I want to connect you with a church. There's lots of great churches all over the world that I would like to catch you or get you connected with. So would you please reach out. My number, uh, my email is on the screen right now. Uh, if you're here in the building, come and find me. And I would love to just continue to pray with you and share how Christ Jesus has transformed my own life. I want to thank you again, each one of you, for joining us today. We are so blessed that we have this opportunity to share the goodness of Jesus Christ with you each and every week. I want to say these closing words that Jesus loves you, and I pray that you would experience that love, because it is that love that will sustain you and keep you, even in the most difficult of seasons, for all of eternity. Thank you so much again for joining us, and God bless. Bye for now.